Okay, guys, so those of you don't, don't, that don't know me, I'm Renee Dryling. I'm the pastor's assistant here at the church. I lead the women's ministry, and my husband, Matt, you guys have heard from him before. He's leading them in tonight. Um, we've been coming to Celebration for about 10 years now, and um, we've been married for 23 years. Um, we've been together for 28. So if you do that math, it means that I was 14 when I started dating my husband. Um, and when I was preparing for this teaching, I just thought to myself, what I wouldn't give to be able to go back to where you're sitting right now and tell myself all of the things that I wish I would have known so that I could have a do-over. But unfortunately, that's not the way that life works. We have to obviously go through things before we can learn them most of the time. But I hope that tonight you take something away from me. It's an honor to be here and to share with you, um, knowing that I... I would have loved to have heard these things from you. I was a very naive little girl, and man, what I, what I would have done to have listened to somebody in, in my position when I was sitting in your shoes. Um, we have two children. Ethan's 19, and um, Allie's 16. Um, actually, yeah, Ethan's 19. I almost made him a year older. He's 19, and Allie's 16, and we definitely don't know anything in their eyes, but I'm asking you to um, remember that tonight, and the next time your parents have something to share with you, just think about it. You don't even have to pretend like you're listening, but just take it to heart, because they really do know what they're talking about. So we've been abundantly blessed with God's presence in our lives, but the people that you know today that work here at the church are not the same people that we were when we were your age. Um, we weren't saved until we were in our 30s, and we lived in the world, we lived for the world, and we lived by the world's standards. And as you can imagine, that led us down a horrible path. And that is why I am honored to be here with you guys today. You guys have been going through a series on relationships, and this is the last week, week four, and today we're gonna be answering the question, what does it mean to be a godly woman? And to put the word godly in front of woman infers that there is a distinction between that which is godly and that which is just woman. The world we live in today is struggling to define these terms, and our culture is at war about questions like, what is a woman? Some believe we can choose our gender based off of how we feel and have given freedom not to just be a man or a woman, but did you guys know that there's even school districts that are allowing litter boxes in the classroom for children who believe that they are an animal? I know it's absolutely absurd, but it's happening today, and that's why this, important, this question is so important for you to understand and to really grasp as a godly woman, as a Christian. Um, our children are being indoctrinated every day, whether we want to believe it or not. And there are some states, in fact, um, a child was just taken away from their parents because the parents wouldn't allow the um, surgeon to genetically change their, their sex. And the state took their child from them. And these are real issues that we're going to have to face. And so this is a really important question to think about. Another movement on the other end of it is called the trad movement. Have you guys heard of that one? Um, it is the movement that says that women should look like the June Cleaver. Have you guys heard of Leave it to Beaver? Hopefully you guys all have. Okay, no. Well, it was a, um, a TV show probably back in the... I don't even know. Don't look. You're going to have to look it up because I don't know. But basically, the mom that stayed at home, worked at home, had dinner on the table for dad, was wearing the dress, did everything in the home, um, basically was there to just serve. And that is not a godly woman either. Yes, those are some godly characteristics. But we see these two extremes. And I bring all of this up because what does it mean to be a godly woman? When we understand, I've got three points for you tonight. When we understand that we have a divine plan, that we have a divine perspective, and that we have a divine, divine purpose, those extremes that I mentioned to you go away. And we, we gain clarity about living in his world and by his standards and for his kingdom. Instead of all those things I mentioned earlier about living in our way, in our world, and doing the things we wanted to do. So what does it mean to be a godly woman? First, a godly woman knows her part in God's divine plan. If you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Genesis, first book of the Bible. Um, before we can determine what it means to be godly, we must look at God's divine design. In chapter one, verse 26, 
Actually, just in chapter one, God created the heavens and the earth, the waters, vegetation, day and night, sea creatures and livestock, and he saw that it was all good. He then made man in the image of God. Look with me at verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Then let's look at Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man out of, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Finally, let's look at 2, verses 18 through 23. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In these verses, we not only see a creation order, but we see two specific genders, male and female. Not male, female, whatever animal you decide to be today. Male and female. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. Psalm 139.13 says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Backed by science, these truths found in God's word establish that God created male and female for distinct purposes within his earthly kingdom. Let's go back to verse 18 in chapter 2. It says, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. You see, woman was designed to be a helper. To some, this immediately denotes inferiority, but that is far from the truth of God's divine design. Man was created in the image of God, and God is triune, which means he is three co-equal persons, each with different roles in one being. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Like the image of God, man and woman are to reflect the same concept. Two equal persons becoming one. Man needed one who was equal but different. Woman's role was to be a helper, and the Hebrew word used for helper was ezer, which is the same word that is used frequently in Scripture to describe God himself. This role was in no way inferior, but different, and one that should be embraced by the woman of God today. So back up with me a minute to a command given in Genesis 1.28, where God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Our God-given desires for marriage and family, they were given to us through God's divine design. We were created to come alongside man and fill the earth. Through these desires, all of the characteristics that make up being a godly woman are birthed. So first, a godly woman knows her part in a divine plan. Point number two is that she lives with a divine perspective. A godly woman lives with a divine perspective, one that is founded upon a truth in Proverbs 31, you guys probably familiar with this, which details the woman who fears the Lord. Proverbs 31.30 says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I would assume that a lot of you in this room are single. Some of you are married. But I would pose the question to you single ones. You know, you might be asking, what does this account have to do with me? I'm single. This passage is speaking to a married woman or about a married woman. And while the description about marriage may not be applicable applicable to a single woman. It does speak of a woman of noble character, and that applies to all of us. This passage applies to all of us. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? The word fear in this instance means reverence. It means to stand in awe. Psalm 111.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, All who practice it have a good understanding. Wisdom is the link between the fear of the Lord and a godly, virtuous life. The word used for wisdom does not simply mean knowledge or intelligence, 
but the right use of knowledge. It involves not only knowing scripture, but applying it and allowing the Lord to lead the way we think and live out our daily lives. Wisdom begins with a reverential awe of God as he is revealed to us in scripture. And the more we know and apply his word, the more godly we become. So what are some ways we can grow in wisdom and fear of the Lord? First, and this is so important, there's no greater um, thing that you guys can do but to put God in the center of your life. Make him the center of all that you do. Live by his standard. Seek him first. Find ways to fill your life with scripture. Find a good Bible study. Hopefully you guys are in a life group. Do a morning devotion. Spend time with him daily. Um, Pay attention to what you are reading. What are you watching? Who are you listening to? What do you do in your free time? Are those things pulling you away from God or are they pulling you towards God? Whether we realize it or not, we make time for the things that matter the most to us. Let me repeat that. We make time for the things that matter the most to us. A woman who fears the Lord will seek that which is eternal and not the things of this world. Does this mean I can't have any fun? Of course not. It just means that the more you allow God into your life, the more that he's going to change us. And that's a process, a churchy word called sanctification. He is always going to be working on us from the time that we are saved until the time we go see him in heaven. We are always going to be in process. And the way that we do that is by living out his word and putting his word to work in our lives. Second, devote yourselves to prayer. Guys, I had to take a time out before I even walked in here because I got some bad news and I was not in a good headspace and I went to prayer and that is how I battled. And it is by God's grace that I'm ever able to get up here, but it is his power that works within us and prayer unlocks that power. Um, It doesn't just, it recenters our thoughts on him. It it takes what's going on around us and it minimizes it because we look at who God is compared to who our problems are. When we get that out of balance, that's when stress and anxiety and fear come into our lives. But prayer flips that. It It puts God back in his rightful place. And you know, even Jesus had to withdraw. We see him withdrawing over and over and over again in prayer, reaching out for the Father. John 15, five says that we can do nothing apart from God because our power comes from him. So let's reach into our source and withdraw that power. We need to pray consistently throughout the day. Challenge yourself to set a timer. Um, I have a friend that sets a timer for three o'clock every day, so she stops in the middle of her day and prays. Pray before you get out of bed. Pray before you go to bed in the evening. And if prayer is not something that comes naturally to you, pray and ask God to help you do that. He will help you do that. It's amazing how many times I wake up and the first thought I have is a worship song or something that God said to me or scripture. And I'm like, okay, that's the Holy Spirit telling me to focus my day, to start my day with him before I even get out of bed. Um, A friend of mine even challenged me when I'm in my car, keep the radio off and pray. And I don't, you guys have to try it because I don't know how many times I have reached for the volume, like, man, it's quiet in here. And I'm like, nope, I did that on purpose, turn it back down. But even five minutes going from place to place can totally change your mindset. So keep God at the center of your life, stay in prayer, and then find a community. Guys, there's nothing more important than the people you surround yourself with. Proverbs 27, 17 tells us that iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. We all need community to help us grow in our faith. Who do you have challenging you? Who are you pouring into? I once heard it this way. We all need a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. We need someone to be pouring into us and challenging us. We need someone to come alongside us and encourage us like Barnabas. And we need someone that we can be teaching like Timothy. There's a very wise saying that goes a little something like this. If you want to know who you're going to be in five years, look at the people around you. Are they going in the same direction you want to be going? Or are they going to lead you astray? If not, if they're not going in the same direction you want to be going, it might be time to change your friends because Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. 
So a godly woman knows that she has, she's part of a divine plan. She lives with a divine perspective and a godly woman lives for a divine purpose. When a godly woman knows her role in God's plan and lives with divine perspective, <clears throat> based on the word of God, she knows this truth that's found in Ecclesiastes. It says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God. When I was your age, I had no idea why I was here, what I wanted to do with my life, and I searched for the answers for my purpose in all the wrong places. Maybe not the wrong places, but in all the places that the world told me to search for them. Love, marriage, my career, my family, my friends, wealth. But they all left me empty and discontent, searching for that next thing that's going to make you happy. But there is nothing that this world can offer you to bring you true contentment. That only comes from knowing whose we are and why we are here. And those questions can only be asked by your creator. And I find it very ironic that he's the only one that can answer why we are here, and yet so many people turn away from him. And that is exactly why our world is in the state of chaos that it's in. Both man and woman are to glorify God, like Ecclesiastes told us. And we are also both supposed to follow the Great Commission. You guys all know those first, probably heard it a million times. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. I would assume we all know this, but for women, we have been given even further instructions Turn with me to, to Titus chapter 2. Titus is going to be towards the back of, your, back of your Bible. And as you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So in Titus, Paul was writing to his disciple Titus, who was pastoring a church. And he was facing a lot of opposition from ungodly men and women. And in order to gain the respect of these unbelievers so that they would hear the gospel, they had to be set apart. And Paul was instructing Titus to be set apart in these verses, what it looks like to be set apart from the unbelievers. They were to live righteous, loving, selfless, and godless lives. And he divides this chapter into, or in these verses kind of into four parts. He talks to older men, he talks to older women, he talks to younger men and younger women. So let's just read these verses together. Titus chapter two, verses one through five. He says, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So looking at these verses, I want to, I want to direct your attention to the first few words that say, but as for you... Who is the you he is talking about in this context? He's talking about believers. Paul is telling Titus that believers must look different than the world around them. In the verses just before, Paul laid out what unbelievers look like. He said they are arrogant, they are quick-tempered, they are a drunkard, they're violent, they're greedy for gain, they're insubordinate, they're deceivers. Instead, Men and women of God, Christians, are to be set apart, living above reproach. This is what it looks like. He lays out the goal of what a godly woman should look like. Let's look at some of those descriptors laid out specifically for women. He says you are to be reverent. Going back to where we started, reverential fear. We are to be reverent means we are to be in awe of God and to want to, um, to have that desire to please him, to live according to his word, to be obedient to his word. But it also means to be dignified. It means to be sensible and honorable and spiritually healthy. All that we do has to come from a foundation of our spiritual health and everything else will fall into place. Second, we are not to be slanderers. 
Slanderer is used 34 times in the New Testament, and it refers to Satan, the arch slanderer. Did you know that when we slander, we are working for the enemy? What is slander? The action or crime of making a false statement damaging to a person's reputation. Let me say that again. The action or crime of making a false statement damaging to a person's reputation. How many of us have fallen prey to that? As I was preparing for this, that one really stung because how often do we say something that's not true or a half truth out of hurt or bitterness? Slander is very damaging and when we use it, we are working for the enemy. And it hurts to be on the other side of that too. It really hurts. So we are to be reverent, we're not to slander. We are to teach what is good. What is good? It's what's laid out for us in this. This is our standard of what is good and evil in this world. We are to train the young women. Remember when I talked about finding someone to challenge you, mentor you, train you up? That is because it is a mandate given here in this passage. Because the beauty of the gospel is lived out when older women pour into younger women and teach them ways of godly living. Older women must exemplify these virtues. And when I say older, I'm not saying age-wise. Yes, obviously wisdom and experience and all of those things come with age. But I'm talking spiritually mature. There is always going to be someone that you feel that you can pour into no matter your age, and there is someone that you can be, that can be pouring into you that may be younger than you. So it's not necessarily physical age, but your spiritual age. Ladies, we are to love our husbands. I know you guys, some of you aren't married, some of you might be dating, but love is not what the, what did you say? I said I love my husband. Oh, she loves her husband, that's so cute. Um, they, um, the love is totally different by the world standards compared to what we're told in the Bible, isn't it? And we live in a world that says, I just married the wrong person. I just, I, I, I just can't live with them anymore. I, I, he's not the right person for me. He's not making me happy. And that is not what love is. When we get married, we make a covenant. Love is unconditional. In 1 Corinthians 13, you guys all know this, the wedding verses. Love is patient and kind. It is not arrogant or rude or envious or boastful or jealous. It doesn't insist on its own way. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It is not resentful. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. If you were to ask an unbelieving friend what love is, would they explain it this way? No, probably not. And that's why we have, to, we have to exhibit that in our marriages. And you know, one of the best ways to show unconditional love is to love them even when, and especially when, they don't deserve it and are the most unlovable. And Matt's not in here right now, and there are times that he is really hard to love. But I love him with all of my heart, and it's a choice to, to love him. It is a choice every day. Marriage is hard. For those of you that are married, the first couple years of our marriage were so hard, so many changes, so many transitions, but we didn't have the word of God and I didn't have people around me to hold me up. So reach out for help if you guys need help. If you need someone to talk to, I would be happy to talk to you. The girls would be happy to talk to you. Um, you are not alone. And marriage is so beautiful when it's pictured the way that God has designed it. It's just sometimes it takes us a while to figure out what that's supposed to look like. So when the day comes, if you're not there already, love your husbands. Show the world what it looks like to unconditionally love someone. We are to work at home. We are to keep a godly home with excellence for one's husband and children. That is our Christian responsibility. But does this mean we can't work outside the home? No. Does this mean that men aren't supposed to help us at home? No. Absolutely not. This means that our first ministry is in the home. I think it is important to note that this is gonna look different for all of us. When my kids were little, I stayed at home, but that was something that we had the option of doing, and I understand that that's not always going to be the case. I didn't start working again until about five years ago when I started here at the church again, and 
I, I just encourage you as you go into that season of your life to pray and ask God what he wants from you because it's going to look different for all of us. Don't compare yourself to anybody else's story. Don't believe the lie that you have to be a stay-at-home mom. That is not godly. What is godly is that no matter whether you are working at home or whether you are working outside the home, is that your first ministry, your first priority is the home. Um, and I think a good quote to remember and that I have hanging in my office to remind me every day is that the most important work you will ever do is within the walls of your home. That is our first and foremost priority. God, your husband, and then your children and then everything else. And as long as your heart is in the right areas in each of the, or in the right place in each of those areas, you are going to live a godly way in this area. So it also says to be submissive to your own husband. And man, did this cause a lot of fights in our lives before we knew the Lord, because it comes with a really negative connotation. I was not gonna submit to him. He was not gonna tell me what to do. And I still have to fight that a little bit, but... Um, when you really look at the true definition of what submission is, it is something that was put in place for our protection and to reflect our love and obedience for Christ. M Matt didn't write that Bible verse, God did. And so I had to redirect my thoughts in what this looks like. And, and instructions for submission are found in Ephesians 5. If you guys can turn there with me, you can, or you can read it up on the screen. It says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that's honestly where we should stop. Because if we both do that, then there really isn't any issues in our marriage. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. To who? To the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. When this plays out, this is what marriage is supposed to look like and it's loving and gracious and kind and it reflects the gospel, it reflects the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Like we talked about, there are three equal persons and one being with a different function and that's exactly how this lays out for us too. We are two equal persons coming together as one with different functions. And I could probably keep you here till next week, well, it's spring break, so maybe the week after, but talking about this subject. And I'm not gonna go into more, I think that could be a whole sermon series in itself, but I will leave you with this quote that I found in a book called The True Woman by Susan Hunt. It says, submission, whether it is to God, to one another, to husbands, or to male leadership in the church, is a grace-empowered virtue of humility and reverence for God. It has nothing to do with superior or inferior status or equality. It has to do with attitude and function. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal in being and in power, but each has a different function. Submission is not about behaviors, it is about character. So it's all about an issue of, it's all an issue of the heart. If we can't submit to our husbands, we're not gonna be able to submit to God. And like I said, it is something that was put in place for our protection and to glorify God. So why all of these instructions on godly conduct? Let's look again at Titus 2.5. At the very end of Titus 2.5, it says, so that the word of God may not be reviled. Our lives are a reflection of the gospel. Are you someone that others strive to imitate? Do you live out what you preach? Do you stand apart from the world? We must live godly lives so as not to bring dishonor to the word of God, and we do all of these things so that we may adorn the word of God. And ladies, you're not gonna be perfect. We're gonna fail at this every single day. The important issue is where are our hearts and how are we going to continue to grow more and more godly each and every day? So all of these truths that I mentioned here are reflected in Proverbs 31. And I just wanna read verses 10 through 31 together. Remember that these principles all apply, they apply to all of us whether married or not. 
And the title of this section is called The Woman Who Fears the Lord. So an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, excuse me, I don't know why that was a twang, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. And here's where we started this evening. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. You see, this woman in this illustration knew her divine plan. She knew she had a divine perspective and she lived for a divine purpose. We see her character as a wife. We see her devotion to working at home, her generosity, her kindness, her influence as a teacher, her effectiveness as a mother, and her excellence as a person. When I was your age and attending Fort Hayes, I was anything but a godly woman. I knew of God. I lived by the world's standards, as I mentioned at the beginning of the evening. Matt and I got married our junior year and got busy living a life according to the American dream. You know the one. And we were far from... Um, anything that would bring us true joy and happiness and contentment. We worked hard, we started a family, we did all the right things, right in the same, in the order we're supposed to do them. Built a home, went on fancy vacations, spent time with friends, started partying too much, grew farther apart and eventually found ourselves miserable and making decisions that we never dreamt we would ever make. But God, God stepped in and in our early 30s, and he saved us. He brought us to the end of ourselves, washing away our foundation that was built on sand and giving us a firm foundation in God. You know, we discovered that everything we were searching for in the world could only be found in God. We stopped living in the world and for the world and by the world standards and started living in his world for his kingdom and by his standards alone. And the only reason I'm standing here today, proud to be, be working to be a woman of God is by his grace and his grace alone because I am far from perfect. So why am I sharing all of this with you? Because you have the opportunity that I didn't at your age. There's so much pain that I could have avoided if I had, but that wasn't my story. You are sitting here with all the answers you need to life's questions in this book. You've been put here on this earth at this time in Hayes, Kansas, at Fort Hayes, University, Fort Hayes State University, in this church surrounded by these people um, for a reason, a reason that far exceeds our understanding. You all have the opportunity to stand apart from the world as godly women and to be the change that this generation and all generations to come need desperately. So I want to leave you with this verse from Esther chapter 4, verse 14. It says, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So I ask you, when others look at you, do they see a godly woman, one who knows her part in God's divine plan, 
who lives with a divine perspective and who lives for a divine purpose. We would be wise to listen to Solomon, who was known to be the wisest man in the world when he said, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. For only when we understand this truth will we be able to live as the godly women we were created to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the women in this room. I thank you for where they're at in their journey with you. I thank you that you speak to them. I thank you for the words that um, nudge their hearts this evening. Lord, I pray that they would take those and give them to you in prayer, that they would meditate on what spoke to them this evening and work to just continue to be more and more like you each and every day. Lord, I pray that we would be reminded that your grace is what allows us to do that each and every day. Lord, that you have promised that you who have started a good work in us will see it through to completion. Um, Lord, that we are not asked to be perfect, but we are just called to be obedient and let you do the work that only you can do. Lord, I pray a blessing over these ladies, over their futures, over their opportunities to be women of God, to be generation changers, and to um, be kingdom builders. Lord, I know that you have placed them here for your divine purpose, and I can't wait to see it all play out. Lord, we just pray that as we leave here tonight that we would um, take you with us in all that we do, and that we would be... Um, keeping you at the center of our lives, that we would be consistent in prayer and that we would um, continue to surround ourselves with people that will help us be more like you. And we just thank you for this time and it's in your heavenly name that I pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was an honor.